Greetings, friends, and a very happy Sabbath to you on this fifth day of July, 2014, day after Fourth of July, and on the that's on the pagan Roman calendar that the United States has adopted, the UK has adopted, the whole world has adopted. On the God's holy sacred calendar, the Hebrew calendar, it is the what day is it here? Hold on a moment. Oh, <laughs> I can't see it with that on the screen. Um, Let's see, it is the seventh day of the fourth month. And friends, that means the next holy day is still almost three months away because we've got all of the fourth month, all of the fifth month, all of the sixth month, and then the first day of the seventh month, that's the Feast of Trumpets. Now, I'm going to talk to you after Mr. Armstrong today. We've got a broadcast on the history of the church that he's going to cover. And then I've got a new chart I want to share some things with you from that relate to today's broadcast. So let's go now to Mr. Armstrong for today's Sabbath service. I speak as a voice crying out in the 20th century wilderness of religious confusion showing what is soon coming on this world. The subject of Armageddon and the end of the world has been appearing in the public press more or less often in the last 25 years. The disciples asked Jesus Christ for a sign of his second coming and the end of the world, and he replied, as you find in Matthew 24 and verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Believe it or not, he was speaking of this very program to which you were viewing and listening at this moment. I would like to show you the very gospel that Jesus did preach. It's recorded in Mark, the first chapter, and beginning with the very first verse, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Coming down to verse 14, now after that John, John the Baptist, was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel, but what gospel? The gospel of the kingdom of God. That's the government of God, the family of God governing the whole world, and saying the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. And he said, repent and believe the gospel. People have not been able to believe a gospel that has not been preached, a gospel they never heard, because it had not been heard for some 1,900 years. Within 22 years after the church was founded, and it was founded in 31 A.D., the gospel of Jesus Christ was suppressed, and a different gospel was proclaimed a gospel about Christ, but not the gospel of Christ. And there's all the difference in the world. We read in Galatians 1, beginning with verse 6, I marvel, Paul wrote, that you were so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. In 22 years they were turning to another gospel, which is not another but there be some that would trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now I want you to notice something else that Jesus said back in Matthew 24. And as Jesus sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. This was to his disciples 1900 and some 50 years ago. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and shall deceive many. Many would come preaching about Christ, saying that Jesus is the Christ, and would deceive many. By... About 50 A.D., a violent controversy was going on about whether the proper gospel to be preached was the gospel of Christ, which would be the gospel he preached, the kingdom of God, 
or a gospel about Christ, just talking about Christ as the messenger who brought the gospel. And we find that what has been preached from that time on has been merely a gospel about Christ. Just believe on Christ. Oh, yes, it goes all around the world. Preaching Christ to the nations. It's going on today. There's a great deal of that. Just believe on Christ. But they don't mention the gospel of Christ, the gospel he preached. They leave that out, and it gives no meaning to life. No purpose of God. And people don't know the purpose of God or the purpose of human life. Now, Jesus foresaw the future of the church in uh, seven successive eras of time, seven spaces of time, one following the other from 31 A.D. when the church was founded up until the second coming of Christ, which is just a few years ahead of us right now at this time. And that is in the second and the third chapters of Revelation. The book of Revelation records seven messages to seven churches that existed in Asia Minor towards the end of the first century A.D. These churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, were located along one of the mail routes of the old Roman Empire. Riders would follow the route, carrying messages from town to town. The messages to the seven churches have words of both encouragement and correction, and they clearly show the dominant characteristics of each of the congregations at that time. But these messages were intended for a wider audience than the Christians in these small towns. They are a series of remarkable prophecies by which the future of the true church was predicted in outline form from the day it began on Pentecost 31 AD until the second coming of Christ. The history of the church would fall into seven distinct eras, each with its own strengths and weaknesses and its own special trials and problems. Just as a message could pass along the mail route from Ephesus to Laodicea, so would the truth of God be passed from era to era. It was like a relay race in which the baton is passed from runner to runner, each one doing his part until the finish line is reached. It has not been an easy race. God's servants often had to run in the face of ridicule and persecution as they strived to keep alive the truth that had been entrusted to them. Through the centuries, the church pressed onward, enduring the trials of the moment, always looking forward to the day when their faith and courage would be rewarded. Now, from about 50 A.D., to 150 A.D., a whole century, I call it the lost century because the history of what was going on in the church is missing at that time. Scholars and church historians recognize that events in the early Christian church between 50 and 150 A.D. can only be seen in vague outline, as if obscured by a thick mist the noted English scholar Samuel G. Green in A Handbook of Church History wrote, The thirty years which followed the close of the New Testament canon and the destruction of Jerusalem are in truth the most obscure in the history of the church. In the course of Christian history, William J. McLaughlin wrote, But Christianity itself had been in the process of transformation as it progressed, and at the close of the period, was in many respects quite different from the apostolic Christianity. In History of the Christian Church, Philip Schaff wrote, The remaining 30 years of the first century are involved in mysterious darkness, illuminated only by the writings of John. This is a period of church history about which we know least and would like to know most. But if we look closely through this mist, we can begin to see what was happening. 
world in which Christ founded his church was the world of the Roman Empire, the greatest and most powerful empire that had ever existed. It stretched from Britain to the far reaches of modern-day Turkey, encompassing peoples from many different backgrounds and cultures under one system of government. Rome's ruling hand was firm, but the subject people enjoyed considerable freedom within the compass of Roman law. Providing all citizens and conquered peoples paid due homage to the Roman emperor, they were also allowed to practice their religious beliefs and worship the gods of their ancestors. After the day of Pentecost, the apostles began to follow Christ's instruction to go to all the world, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Once Christianity spread from Judea to the Gentile lands to the north, it began to encounter those who practiced the pagan religions of Babylon, Persia, and Greece. Many who called themselves Christian had not been truly converted. But throughout this period, all who called themselves Christian suffered greatly from the Roman authorities because they refused to worship the emperor. The Jews of Palestine finally rose in rebellion against the Roman authorities. The rebellion was suppressed and Jerusalem was destroyed in A.D. 70. A small number of true Christians in Jerusalem fled over the mountains to the safety of Pella. Sometime during those first two centuries, the baton was passed from the Ephesian era to the people that God had called to the Smyrna era of his church. Powerless, often persecuted and rejected as heretics, the world lost sight of them. Instead, there emerged from the lost century a church that was steadily growing in popularity, but growing further away from the gospel that Jesus taught. Persecution continued at various times under the Romans until the 4th century, when Constantine recognized the church as an official religion of the empire. But the church that he recognized was by now very different from the church that Jesus founded. Once Constantine recognized them, this church threw renewed energy into taking its message to the world. Teachers and preachers went to all parts of the Roman Empire with a message about Christ. Thousands, maybe millions, heard this gospel and believed it, but it was not the gospel of the kingdom of God. So we find the fourth church described in Revelation, the book of Revelation, 17th chapter and verse 5, where it says, Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. But the true church is described in the twelfth chapter of the book of Revelation as a small fleeing and persecuted church, having to flee from the great church. Emperor Constantine died in A.D. 337, just over 300 years after Christ was crucified. He had given his blessing to a church that claimed to be the one that Christ founded. Now that they were free from fear of oppression, the persecuted became persecutors. Those who dared to disagree with their doctrine were branded as heretics, worthy of punishment. In A.D. 365, the Council of Laodicea wrote in one of its most famous canons, Christians must not Judaize by resting on the Sabbath, but must work on that day, rather honoring the Lord's day. But if any shall be found to be Judaizers, let them be anathema from Christ. The small remnant of Christians of the Smyrna era fled once more to seek the religious freedom they needed to practice their beliefs. And so the baton passed from the Smyrna Christians to those of the Pergamos era. These had been called to carry the truth through one of history's most difficult periods, the Middle Ages. 
power and influence of the great universal church spread far and wide, driving those who clung to the truth of God ever further into the wilderness. One thousand years after Jesus had founded his church, the exhausted remnant of the Pergamos era handed over the baton. The Thyatiran era got off to a vigorous start, preaching repentance throughout the Alpine valleys of southern France and northern Italy. Many heard and were converted. The religious authorities quickly reacted to this challenge. Leaders of the true church were arrested. Some were martyred. After the death of its first leaders, the church went into a temporary decline, but emerged once more under the dynamic leadership of Peter Waldo. For several years in the 12th century, they flourished in the Alpine Valleys, preaching what truth they had. Booklets and articles were written and copied by hand. This was still before the days of printing. But once again, persecution followed, as the full force of the Inquisition was felt in the peaceful valleys that had once provided a safe haven for the work of God. Meanwhile, the world was changing. Printing had been invented, and knowledge began to be increased. The Protestant Reformation plunged Europe into religious conflict. As religious wars swept across the European continent during the Middle Ages, many refugees fled to the relative safety and tolerance of England. Among them were members of the true church. They brought with them their doctrines and beliefs, especially the knowledge of the Sabbath. The strict Sunday-observing Puritans resisted, but in spite of a rising tide of opposition, in the early 17th century, there were several small Sabbath-keeping congregations in England. Jesus was raising up the fifth era of his church, Sardis. Protestant England became increasingly intolerant of dissenters, including Sabbath-keepers. The true church in England withered and all but died out. But across the ocean, men were beginning to discover a new world. Stephen Mumford, a member of a Sabbath-keeping church in London, left England for Newport, Rhode Island in 1664. Finding none who kept the Sabbath, Mumford and his wife began to fellowship with a Baptist church in Newport. Several members of the Sunday-keeping congregation became convinced that they, too, should observe the Sabbath. They became the first Sabbath-keeping congregation in America. Others joined them in their belief as God began to call more to his work in the new world. By the mid-1800s, Sabbath-keeping congregations could be found throughout the Midwest. They moved their headquarters to Marion, Iowa, and then to Stanbury, Missouri. A magazine, The Bible Advocate, was published. Their efforts bore some fruit. Small congregations sprung up across the nation. And so it was that sometime in the 19th century, a small congregation of the true Church of God was established in the peaceful Willamette Valley in Oregon. They were farmers without formal education. They lacked trained ministers to teach and guide them. But they had the name Church of God, and they faithfully kept the Sabbath day. God's church had come a long way across the turbulent centuries since the day of Pentecost. It was weak and lacked influence. Years of persecution and compromise had taken their toll. Much truth had been lost, but they had stayed the course. In the Willamette Valley, they waited. It was nearly time for the baton to change again into the hands of those God would call to do his end-time work. As mankind neared the end of 6,000 years of Satan's misrule of the earth, God's church had to be ready for a new and critical phase of the work. Jesus had prophesied that before the end could come, the true gospel of the kingdom must be preached to all the world as a witness. As man's knowledge increased, 
the technology began to be developed by which a voice could indeed cry out and be heard around the world. And so, as God had raised up Elijah and John the Baptist as his special messengers, he now raised up a man to work in the power and spirit of Elijah, preparing the way for Christ's second coming. Herbert W. Armstrong was born July 31, 1892, in Des Moines, Iowa, of substantial God-fearing parents. He was the eldest son of Horace Elon Armstrong, who was the eldest son of Nathan Armstrong, who was the eldest son of Samuel Armstrong, who was married to Elizabeth Cope. The family genealogy has been preserved through the Cope Foundation and can be traced back to Princess Joan, the daughter of Edward I, the King of England between 1272 and 1307. And thus through a royal line that can be traced back to King David of ancient Israel. As a young man from age 18, Herbert Armstrong became unusually successful in the field of magazine and newspaper advertising. At age 25, he was married to Loma Dillon, an Iowa school teacher. I was successful in the magazine field, in advertising, and in journalism. And then the flash depression of 1920, followed by the Great Depression of 1929, just took away my business. And after a few years, I was reduced to absolute poverty. Then in that condition, with financial success taken away, I was challenged in the autumn of 1926 on the subject of evolution and on the Bible Sabbath. My wife had taken up with the Bible Sabbath which she had found in the Bible. I was furious. To me, I thought that was religious fanaticism, and I didn't want that in my home. I said, the Bible says Sunday is the day. She says, have you ever seen it there? I said, no, but I know it's there because the churches can't be wrong, and all of the churches get their religion out of the Bible, and they observe Sunday. She says, well, do they get the religion out of the Bible? Why don't you look into it and see? And so I did. I went into an intensive, in-depth study of both the subject of evolution and the Bible. I studied Darwin, Huxley, Haeckel, other evolutionists of the time. Finally, however, to make a long story short, I proved that evolution was a false thing altogether, a false theory. I proved the existence of God Almighty. Furthermore, I proved the absolute authority of the Bible as the very Word of God to us, to mankind today, as an authority that is infallible and can be relied upon. In the end, I had to, as they say, eat crow. My wife was right. I found the Sabbath was in the Bible. I researched history. I found one of the things that has just been quoted to you uh, back in uh, the Council of Laodicea. And I was brought to see how wrong I had been. I was brought to a real repentance. I not only accepted Christ as my Savior, I gave myself to Him. Now, I was led into contact with that little group of Sabbath-keeping people in the Church of God in the Willamette Valley up in Oregon. I was baptized in the spring of 1927, precisely 100 time cycles from the time that Jesus began teaching His disciples. And now Jesus began teaching me in the Bible, because Jesus is the personal Word of God, and the Bible is the same Word of God in writing. And I was taught by the same Christ that the early apostles were. Then I began working with this Church of God, and 
I was ordained in June of 1931, precisely right down to practically the day and the very month of the time that the uh, 100 time cycles after the original apostles had been ordained in Jerusalem in 31 A.D. And this was in 1931. Now, out of that humble beginning, that remnant of the Church of God, has emerged, finally, the worldwide Church of God. For 35 years, this church grew at the rate of 30% every year for 35 years. And through it, God has restored the truth of the Bible, which tradition had mutilated. Through tradition, it had been destroyed. But God has preserved his truth in the Bible, and it is absolute authority. It has been preserved, and today the kingdom of God is being preached to the world, the gospel of the kingdom of God, the only true gospel of Jesus Christ, and it is being preached on this program. Now, before I close, I want to offer you a booklet on the true gospel, because a false gospel has been preached. I have a very small booklet here. What is the true gospel? The world has been deceived. You read in the 12th chapter of Revelation that Satan the devil has deceived all nations and all religions, incidentally. And we're in a time of religious confusion today. The Bible straightens it all out. The Bible is the faithful word of God. Jesus Christ is that word. And the Bible is just Jesus Christ in writing. Now, also, I'd like to send you a year's subscription. The Plain Truth magazine, now over 6 million copies monthly. Here, the latest number. Yes, there is life out there. Everyone is wondering, is there life way out in outer space? Yes, there is. The trouble is people have been looking for the wrong kind of life. You'll be interested in this article. Many articles on world conditions, making even biblical truth plain, and giving you meaning of today's news that you'll never get on news reports or newspapers. Now, there's no subscription price. There is no request for money. What we have, we want to give. We'd like to have you receive these publications. The booklet, What is the True Gospel? and the Plain Truth magazine. Just send your request to me, Herbert W. Armstrong. Okay, friends, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come on out right there because um, as our sign on the screen says, uh, the Plain Truth is no longer being published. The Most of the articles and most of the old magazines that were published are available online. Just Google for them. They're online like crazy all over the place. And um, <clears throat> there's a link to them through our, our library uh, on cogtv.org. Let me get that. Let me get that lower third on the bottom out of the way so you can see our uh, website address come through over on the far right side of our lower third cogtv.org on the library tab you can get to most of these old publications and um, <clears throat> um, and I believe Mr. Armstrong simply continuing to talk about his book so uh, and he's saying goodbye all right so we got most of that broadcast on the history of the true church now <clears throat> friends I want to give you a uh, brethren give you a prayer request somebody who really needs some prayer and I also want to try and get to a, um, how am I going to do this? Where do I have the, i, I got to change this while we're on the air. Let's see. Tell you what, let me, uh, let me do this so that I can change that where it won't come forward. I want to show you a slide that I've been, a slide that I've been working on that, um, uh, which one is that over here? Five. Okay, bear with me just a moment while I make some little changes. Okay, I think we got it there. Um, <clears throat> I'm working on a slide that relates to both what Mr. Armstrong was talking about today in the 
uh, in the program in the <clears throat> that he gave. <clears throat> and we'll see what happened. How come that didn't come on? Um, and then let's see. That's zero five. And then the, well, let me go ahead and mention somebody who's needing prayer. <clears throat> and uh, while I work on this other thing, I'm going to put this up on the screen while I tell you about a prayer request. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Jan Gale Le Bleu just sent out word I received yesterday that she has a case of bronchiolitis. And it's knocked her out of three or four days of work this week on a job she just started about three months ago where she's helping handicapped and elderly people with uh, in-home care, that she travels and gives care to these people in their home. And um, there we go. I got that thing working now. And she uh, would appreciate prayer for healing on that uh, bronchiolitis condition that she uh, she has, <clears throat> like I say, not able to work uh, in her brand new job, and <clears throat> and uh, from that from that. So, uh, and we may also be be good. To, I can ask your prayers for Jim Quigley, whose wife died this past week. Jim Quigley uh, goes back to. I first met Jim Quigley in Pasadena. <clears throat> <clears throat> during the early 70s. <clears throat> Excuse me, I need some prayer for my throat, friends. In the early 70s, when I was a student at Ambassador College, I think I first met Jim when he signed up for a ballroom dancing class that I taught as part of Ambassador College continuing education. Mr. Armstrong opened it up to church members, to employees, as well as students. And Jim was one of 400 people that signed up for one of those first classes that we taught. And he'd come over and visit me in my dorm and just talk during the week and uh, let me know what he was doing in his job. He had a job with, I believe it was in publishing. And uh, his wife just died this week, Jim Quigley, living in, North, in South Carolina. I heard about that through uh, a fellow... Ambassador College student of my class, uh, Mark Flynn, who's planning to drive up to South Carolina for that funeral. If I could get off, Mark, I'd love to be able to drive up with you <clears throat> um, for that. But friends, let me go over to this slide just to talk about something related to what Mr. Armstrong was talking about in his program today. This slide... Uh, I'm, it's in progress, and I know I got some awfully small print on there. I'm trying to squeeze a lot of things onto this. This is part of um, one portion of a slide that I use during Nightcast oftentimes when a news story comes up that relates <clears throat> to uh, to history in a way. And uh, pardon me, I'm making one other change, so when I come back, we'll also be able to see that same slide behind me. There we go. Um, <clears throat> All right, because actually, until I'm pointing something out, I, I, like, I like to be able to uh, just talk to you for a moment and it, while I explain what this slide is, and then I'll pull it back up close. <clears throat> this slide, I put the pictures. It's part, I, I took a chart. Now, Mr. Armstrong often encourages us to make our own charts, and in some cases, he made them for us. He labored through, especially some that he did that were published in uh, books related to booklets related to Revelation being unveiled, <clears throat> and uh, now he's always encouraged us to don't believe him, but believe your Bible and to prove things as the Bible tells us to do. And now I've taken that chart and I've cut out pictures from other parts of the booklet, pasted them where they go, and I've cut out pictures from historical documents and pasted them into my chart, you know, one that I use for my personal study, and sometimes I share things on that chart with you. Now, there's a verse in Revelation 17, verse 10, that proves, and you know, in Mr. Armstrong broadcast today, 
he appropriately made some reference to how God called him out a long time ago and <clears throat> how God proved him and how he did six months of proving things, study in libraries. Now, of course, initially he was trying to prove his wife wrong because he was embarrassed about her keeping the Sabbath when the rest of the world worships God, or so they think they do. They observe Sunday, the day of the god Baal. And he wanted to prove his wife wrong about that. Well, lo and behold, it worked out the other way. <clears throat> what he proved true wound up being just what his wife said, but a little more because he came home after doing the study on Colossians 2.16, the original Greek word in, in the original text. And he said, honey, that, that doesn't mean the Sabbath's been, the weekly Sabbath's been done away. It means the weekly Sabbath should be kept. But more than that, it also means the annual Sabbaths should be kept. And so he and she began keeping the annual Sabbaths for seven years without understanding that they had meaning to them or what they meant. And then God opened up Mr. Armstrong's understanding to what each day meant you and I come along, we, we have been given that understanding on a silver platter, Thank, thankfully, because it makes it easy. You under, you, you know, <clears throat> when you're keeping the day and you understand what it means, you learn and grow about the, God's plan of salvation. All right, most of you watching, you know that already. <clears throat> so let me get to our point here. <clears throat> Revel, Revelation 17.10 was something God wrote for our days, basically our days, our time, uh, and the time that preceded us just a little bit, these latter days, Revelation 17.10 is written in the present tense of the year beginning 1936. Let's read that scripture. And that scripture proves how God was using Mr. Armstrong in an extremely special way as one of God's end-time servants, and more than that, his end-time apostle. <clears throat> it tremendously provides support and proof and evidence for that. Let's read that verse first. Revelation 17, chapter 17, Revelation, and verse 10. And it, which says, uh, let's back up to verse 9. And here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Uh, of course, really, we need to back up to verse 5 to really get into who's that woman. And upon the forehead of that woman was a name, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and, the, and abominations of the earth. So all the way back in Revelation, God was saying that the great Roman Catholic Church would have daughters in these modern day times. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Why do you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Now this verse is more or less, <clears throat> excuse me friends, is my, my uh, I'm going to be hearing from my Muslim friend, I'm sure, every time I belch or cough or anything on the show, I hear from him, you know, oh, you did this, you know, of course, then he also tells me, you're reading from that Bible that's not God's word, he will say. Well, excuse me, my friends, but you, this book provides the evidence that it is written by God because it testifies of things God, of areas where God says they'll never be inhabited again and things like that, that, you know, if you can go inhabit those places, and I invite you to go try. <laughs> You're in for a real shock. You won't be able to inhabit the places God says in here cannot be inhabited. That's one of many proofs that this is God's Word. And 
I won't go into the other book that he's writing me about, which many of you know, and it relates to the broadcast we've had this week because of what's going on in Iraq with the Islamic movement and the attempts that are so far appearing to succeed in building and forming up an Islamic state. But let's go back to, let's pick up with verse 8. I was saying verse 8 parallels verse 10 of Revelation 17. Because verse 8 says, The beast that you saw was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. Now that relates in a way to what God says through John in verse 10 of Revelation 17 where he says, and there are seven kings. And God has just explained here that those seven uh, um, heads are seven mountains, and mountains are like governments and kingdoms, and so kings. And there are seven kings, five of which are fallen. Now let me bring this forward. I don't know how well you can see. the On the right-hand side, there are one, two, three, four, five pictures of the five kings that are fallen. When John wrote this on the Isle of Patmos, sometime roughly around 70 A.D., these five kings had not, their time had not yet come. They were not yet in existence. But by 554 A.D., some nearly 500 years later, the first of those five kings appeared, which in this case was Justinian, who restored the old imperial uh, empire, Roman Empire. He conquered areas that would reunite East and West once again, even though they went through some East and West division following that somewhat. But uh, he restored the imperial empire around 554 AD. He was the first head of the restored Holy Roman Empire. The second head was of the Frankish kingdom, Charle <clears throat> Charlemagne, who, <clears throat> who was crowned by the Pope in 800 A.D. And then, and then there's three more. There's uh, Otto the Great, crowned by the Pope in 962 A.D. His picture's there, or, you know, a picture of a statue of him. And then the fourth head was Charles V, crowned by the Pope in 1530. AD, and then Napoleon, the fifth of those five that are fallen, who was crowned in 15, what, we, what does it say here? The print's kind of small. Uh, 1584, 1594, <clears throat> somewhere in there. Fifth, he's the, he was the fifth head, and he, he is part of the first five that are fallen. But then, this verse in uh, Re Revelation 17, verse 10, goes on to say, <clears throat> and one is. Now that makes this verse present tense. But when John wrote it, it was future present tense. And one is. It, that one is was not then when John wrote it. But at the time this verse was to become active or become alive or become meaningful, was 1936 when, if you can see it here in our slide, sixth picture down from the top on the right-hand side, you can see next to Mussolini, I mean next to Hitler, you can see Mussolini with his arm outstretched, and Mussolini was the sixth head of the revived Holy Roman Empire, a revision that <clears throat> lasted only uh, from 1936 to 1945, that'd be roughly about nine years, when Mussolini wound up being strung up upside down on, on April 28, 1945. And, and Mr. Armstrong was, in 1936, Mr. Armstrong was 44 years old. Now, friends, if you've tuned in, you don't know who I'm talking about. Most brethren will, but I'm talking about Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong. As you saw in the video, he was born in July 1892, July 31st, 1892, and that would have made him 
1936 when Mussolini invaded Ethiopia and then announced that he had revived the Holy Roman Empire and kept that empire going until 1945 in April 1945. So Mr. Armstrong was in the prime of his life at that time when God was using him and beginning to show and proving him and beginning to show the world that, at least first of all, this nation, that God was using this man as an end time um, trumpet to warn this nation that we need to obey God and receive God's blessings with the caveat, the warning added to it that if we don't, if we do not obey God, we receive just the opposite of the blessings that God announces in Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. A few of those being that, that I'll bless your agriculture with plenty of rain, your fruit trees will grow. Now that applies to um, individuals as well as the nation. We're, you know, well, the nation's not in the fruit tree business, but there are big corporations that are. People work for corporations. Maybe that's more of an individual one, but it, but overall, it applies to the nation because if it, not just your fruit trees, it applies to if you do, if you got if God blesses you with rain, rain, all of your agriculture grows and your cattle thrive. But if the opposite happens, if God puts you under a curse and withholds the rain, your fruit trees don't grow, your crops don't grow, your cattle uh, get skinny, <clears throat> and um, and you're, 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 the whole nation is under a famine then. Now, we presently are in a kind of a famine in this nation. We're in a drought. We are in the worst drought ever of record for the United States. The worst drought since 1956, and as of a couple of years ago, we just broke the 1956 record, for, and we are now in the worst drought ever. Now, there are areas that are flooded. There are areas that still have a little rain. This worse-than-ever drought can get even worse yet, or a guy can stop it and turn it around. And, it all, and just like God did with Nineveh, when Job finally went on over there and gave the warning to them that they were sinning and that God was going to, to destroy them, that was a conditional destruction it, because of your disobedience. Well, the people, they said, well, let's stop this disobedience and see if God won't have mercy on us. And they fasted in sackcloth and ashes. And to Job's disappointment, God was merciful upon Nineveh and spared them from the destruction he had promised if they continued in their disobedience and their iniquities and evil. Same for people of the United States, people of the United Kingdom, people of France, <clears throat> the modern-day descendants of Manasseh, Ephraim, Reuben, the other modern-day descendants, Judah and the little nation of Israel in the Middle East. <clears throat> And, and, and the other modern descendants around the world where the descendants of Israel, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, and his son uh, uh, and his forefather, Isaac, and his 12 sons, wherever they are now. Um, and we can know where they are, but I I'm just, I'm just want to get back to this point that there are seven kings. Five are fallen. We know who those five were. We know who the sixth head was who was the one is between 1936 and 1945 when God revealed that fact to Mr. Armstrong, who then announced it on his coast-to-coast -coast radio programs in the United States and from Mexico and up into Canada. And we weren't on Radio Luxembourg then yet until 1953, <clears throat> But Mr. Armstrong had been given this truth in 1936, and he was the first one to pronounce this, that the sixth head that now is, is that head that, uh, that came about during Mr. Armstrong's lifetime in 1936, which God revealed to Mr. Armstrong, to him first, 
and it was to him only at that time. Of course, anybody that has heard and listens to Mr. Armstrong can say, oh yeah, well, Mussolini was the sixth head of the revived Holy Roman Empire. Well, duh, yeah, you're just repeating what God gave us through Mr. Armstrong. That was revealed by God through Mr. Armstrong. Now, it's easy for copycats to come along and say, yeah, hey, we know this. But you only know it because God gave it to us and revealed it through Mr. Armstrong first. And then there's a seventh. You know, the rest of that verse says, uh, after it says, and one is, it says, and the other is not yet. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. And that we've got that one to come. There's no picture for him yet. I just got a question mark down there where the seventh head yet to come is positioned in on this chart. Now, I have another chart with larger lettering that cites that verse on the chart, but all day, pretty, pretty much all day yesterday, I've been doing some study because of several videos that have appeared online and because of a, uh, a friendly Muslim <laughs> writing to me after my Nightcast program, writing comment after comment to me. Now, I did not allow those comments to be published because most of them, even though I say he's a friendly Muslim, most of his comments were not that friendly, really. And they called the Bible a lie. Uh, they called me a big fart. I probably shouldn't. I probably shouldn't have told you what he said, but perhaps that's not too bad. He, he well, he said even worse about me. So I, but I won't. I won't tell you everything he said. He every commented on every time I belched. He said I did think things on the air that I didn't do. And he's just really slashing and hacking at me, and he's angry and mad because I'm sharing information I've been learning from. Many, some of you may have seen that video that relates the discoveries of um, that former Jesuit priest who worked in the Vatican, uh, Rivera, 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 um, ah, his name slips me, his full name slips me at the moment, but uh, a former Jesuit priest who appears in an, an interview on one video and then many are quoting him. Of course, he was, he died of what some believe was food poisoning. And, um, in other words, one of his enemies got to him and uh, snuffed him out because he was revealing things that show a connection between the Catholic Church and Muslim. In fact, showing how the Catholic Church helped to establish and cre create and establish the Muslim religion or the Islam religion. Now, the Islam Muslim is not a religion. A Muslim is a person who practices the Islam religion. So there's a distinction between the words. The, the Roman Catholic Church helped to create the Islamic religion. They helped to write the Quran in which one of the truths of the Bible is flipped to say that instead of, and this really made the Muslim guy who wrote me upset and angry, the Bible is a lie. We had to correct that with the Koran. No, you perverted what the Bible says. The Bible is God's word on this. And God said he told Abraham to take Isaac up to the mountain and sacrifice him. And when, he, when, Isaac, when Abraham and Isaac proved true on that, Isaac had to be a willing sacrifice. And when Abraham, his father, Abram, his father then, then Abram, showed himself faithful to God's word to do it, believing, Abram, Abraham believing that God could resurrect his son and keep the promise God made that through Isaac, God would create an offspring for Abraham that would be as numberless as the sand as countless as the stars of heaven. And Abraham believed. He had to believe God would resurrect his son after sacrificing him because you're not going to get offspring through a dead son. 
So Abraham believed, hey, God's going to work this out. He'll resurrect my son at some point in time. But seeing Abraham's faithfulness, God stopped Abraham when he knew Abraham would go through it and would do it. He said, hold it, hold it, Abraham. I got a ram over here in the bush. The Islamic religion in the Quran that was that the bishops of the Roman Catholic Church helped to create, bishops, you know, people, people in the Roman Catholic Church helped to write, that the Pope assigned. You know, he, he had a Catholic woman who had retired and given much of her money who was then put in a convent to be taken care of the rest of her life. He had her marry. Her name was Khadija. Khadija. He had her marry Muhammad and support him and help him to believe he was becoming a prophet of God, which the Catholic Church supported. The Catholic Church, with her money and other money, they supported generals of Arab armies to help bring about this Islamic religion by going into the Middle East areas that the Pope wanted to have under his control, mainly Jerusalem. And that was part of a three-pack deal that's in this video, was to kill Jews and other and true Christians, who people who kept the Sabbath, get them off the map and get them out of the Catholic Church's way but don't touch, don't harm any Catholic people. And then once you've commandeered Jerusalem out of the hands of the Jews and the other Sabbath-keeping Christians over there, turn it over to the Pope. Well, Islam saw an opportunity to create another holy city beside Mecca by building a Dome of the Rock over Jerusalem. They had so captured this area. And that would just further their their power and influence, you know, which the Pope wanted, the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church wanted Jerusalem to further their power. They'd been having big fights in northern Africa, in the second largest city in the Roman Empire, Carthage. They had over 500 million people there. They had millions of people observing the Sabbath. Now, whether these were true believers or just people observing the Sabbath in the way the Jews do it, um, without God's Spirit, you know, I don't know. But their history is showing there were, around 300 A.D., there were millions of people observing the Sabbath. Now, this was an affront to both the beast, the emperors of the Roman Empire, and to the Roman Catholic Church, which, although it hadn't become a full integral, integral part of the uh, Roman Empire just yet, it was fighting for that power. It was in and out with that power struggle. Uh, the woman didn't fully begin riding the beast until the time, as our chart shows here, the time of Justinian, after, or just before Justinian, after he restored the... Uh, imperial made the imperial restoration of the Holy Roman Empire and then now you know what I can go to do I have it on this available on this on this uh, just a moment I'm looking for a chart to slide to see if I have it I'm su surprised I yeah I think maybe I do here is um, Here's the top part of the chart from the book of Revelation with the pictures I've added that uh, keep the old original writing of Mr. Armstrong and yet adopts the color system in later revised charts. Uh, the colors just help your eye flow go down the chart a little easier. And, uh, you know, I took pictures out of the book, plus to, on the bottom part of the chart I took pictures out of ancient history to show who those five kings are. But uh, the woman, you can see the woman at the bottom of this chart. On the left side, you see a woman holding a cup. Um, there's where she begins riding the beast. It's after the first three horns of the ten horns 
um, as being mentioned as ten horns, were overthrown, which the woman did have a little part in wanting to see that overthrow and helping encourage it. But she doesn't start riding this beast until um, until right there at this point when the lower part of this chart, let's see, where do I have the lower part of this chart? Um, where Justinian has restored the Holy Roman Empire. Now, you, I've got her on the top row, and you can see right after that, Justinian has restored imper the imperialism of the Holy Roman Empire. From this point on, she rides the remaining seven horns that are mentioned as the remaining seven horns in Revelation 13, but they're mentioned as seven heads, and they parallel. Mr. Armstrong encouraged us to do a spreadsheet-type chart that helps your eye see how, oh, the remaining seven horns of the ten horns of Revelation 13, those remaining seven horns are horn for horn identical with the seven heads mentioned in Revelation 17, which winds up being the tenth head in all as it's mentioned uh, elsewhere, and it's the same as the tenth horn of Daniel 2, which has ten, that tenth horn has ten toes, and the seventh head has ten horns. And you can see on the chart, even though that sounds confusing as, as, you know, God didn't mean for this to be easy for people to figure out. He meant for through a servant he would explain it and explain how to chart this out so people could then easily see it. When you get it on a chart like this, you can see, hey, ah, I see what's what now. And then just for proving up those five horns and, you know, and helping my study the, on those five horns that are fallen, I did this this other chart, well, what happened to it? Let's see. Oh, all right. Let me come back. Let me come back here for just a moment, and then we'll get over to the other chart. <clears throat> I took this part of the chart and added the pictures to it of the five kings that are fallen, plus the sixth king that was in existence in 1936 to 1945, when God showed that to Mr. Armstrong, and. Um, when he showed that to Mr. Armstrong, and then Mr. Armstrong announced that to the on his broadcast to the rest of the nation and to those of us whom God called, so we could understand this verse, Revelation 17, about five are fallen, one is, but that one is was only is, only present tense between 1936 and 1945. Now that all of that's now past tense. We're now in the present tense part of that verse that says, and one is yet to come. That's a question mark on our chart. He could come. I'm not saying he will. In fact, there are reasons I believe God's going, that I personally believe. Now, this is just me speaking. This is not me speaking with inspiration, I don't think. I'm just, there are reasons I believe God may delay another year, and that reason I believe, believe that is because Brethren, I don't believe all the brethren are ready yet. I'm, and I'm saying the reason for the, uh, for the delay is both you and me. You know, as all of us whom God has called, we're, we're all scattered all over the place, separated in different groups. I don't know how God's going to deal with that. I know he's going to gather us, those who are accounted worthy, to a place of safety. He promises that in various places in the Bible. And he, Luke 21, 36 is one of them where he... he encourages us, instructs us, commands us to watch daily news and be praying about it, become an active part of daily news. When he's saying watch you therefore, the therefore refers back to all the things he's just said. Luke 21 is a parallel chapter to Matthew 24. And Christ in Luke, and Luke is paralleling what Matthew wrote in Matthew 24, where Christ is telling us, he's answering the disciples and telling us today what's going to happen before his return and before the end of this age. Now, I've got a chart that relates to that here, where this is part, well, that's the whole chart, that gives all seven seals, but in this part, uh, Christ explains the first four seals and the four horses where he says there'll be deceivers, there'll be wars, there'll be famines, there'll be pestilence plus earthquakes plus trouble, but not the major trouble. And then those are the first four seals. And then after the trouble of the fourth seal 
it'll grow to an overnight sudden boom of trouble. Uh, the time of Jacob's trouble, the time of the great mega trouble, the great tribulation, a time of the revival of the Holy Roman Empire, a time of World War III, a, t a time of great martyrdom of God's saints like no martyr martyrdom before it has ever, 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 ever been. And all that's part of the answer of what Christ said would happen. Uh, before the fifth seal. He said those things would happen, and he said, watch them. Watch them and be praying about those things, the deception you see around you, and see it in the news with the Pope traveling here and there. You see it with war and rumors of war and another round of world war pending. We've had two rounds so far. Round three of world war is pending, and we're watching events that are leading up to that, and even in secular news, we see people saying and asking the question, will this or that event, things in the Ukraine, things in Iraq, and the Islamic State, will some of these th things in the South China Seas and the row or row between China and Japan, between China and Vietnam, between China and Thailand, between China and whoever's claiming those islands in the South China Seas, will that row help to start the Pacific theater st stage of World War III, round three? Will that revive that over there? Will the things in the Middle East and in Ukraine and in Iraq and the Islamic State, will that revive round three of World War? I mean, people in secular news are asking that question. And when, when that round three revives, God has told us through Mr. Armstrong that that will be the beginning of the Great Tribulation. Well, that'll mean that an army will be surrounding Jerusalem. That means, as I put on my chart, and this is something I'm studying right now, friends, I'm developing a chart. I got one with bigger wording already that relates to Daniel 11, verse 45, beginning in verse 40, where... God is explaining to Daniel how the king of the south and the king of the north are going to wage some war against them in the end times. And at the time of the end, God makes it clear he's not just talking about some time between Daniel's time and now. Now he's talking about now, at the end, at the time of the end, the king of the north shall do certain things in verse 40 and then down by verse 45, that king of the north shall, which, which, at the time of the writing it was, and some of the earlier fil fulfillments, the king of the north was Syria, as Mr. Armstrong understood it, doing things uh, uh, against the king of the south, Egypt. We know that prophecy is dual and that in its dual stage it can have a, a bigger fulfillment. Um, sometimes a more spiritual fulfillment and in the physical realm a definitely bigger fulfillment. And it can mean more than what Syria used to mean by itself, than just Syria. It can mean a united Europe. Um, that's my understanding and take on it. And the king of the south can mean more than Egypt. It can mean the, the uh, people behind Egypt and all all the Arab world. Um, but God does tell us this in that verse 45 of Daniel 11, that that king of the south, that king of the north, I'm sorry, I'm speaking of the king of the north now, that that king of the north shall establish his palace between the two seas and the holy mountain, in other words, in Jerusalem. And, you know, friends, interesting in the history uh, that I've been studying the past couple of days, uh, several days actually, the Roman Catholic Church has wanted that, it wanted Jerusalem going all the way back to around 300 AD. And when, it, when what's now been revealed by the former Jesuit about how the Catholic Church sponsored the wars by the Arabs to attack Jerusalem and throw the Jews out of there and throw any Sabbath keeping true Christians out of there, kill everybody there except the Catholics. 
who were there, the monk, monks and bishops and the Catholics who were there in Jerusalem, and then turn that Jerusalem over to the Roman Catholic Church in exchange for the Catholic Church having financed the Arabs and their generals to and to build this Islamic religion and build up, you know, uh, the Muslims and build, and and their prophet Muhammad. Uh, but the Arabs didn't keep their deal there, and, and they didn't surrender that to the Catholic Church, and that led to history is showing that's what led to the Crusades against the Arabs. Throw them out of Jerusalem and just take it, but they didn't succeed in taking it. The Arabs wound up succeeded later in taking over Constantinople, the eastern headquarters in, of the Roman Empire, and for a time. And it put a Byzantine emperor in there, a, an Arabic Byzantine emperor. Um, all that history is extremely fascinating. I'm, I'm studying it to the point where I've got whew, headaches from all the study, and, and uh, thankfully I get distractions out in the field where uh, my horse and my donkey break fences down and I have to go work on them, so it gives me a little mental relief. You know, much study can be weary of the mind, but it's fascinating, and I, well, I'm eager to learn as much and more as I can about this, and as I do, I'll share with you what I learn, I try to summarize it in little quips and quotes for you so that uh, you can get the highlights and the tidbits real easy. For example, uh, some of the things I put on my chart, I've got more, I just didn't get them worked on here yet. Before the papacy of Rome mounts and rides the beast, at that point we see just above where the five kings begin, or the, you know, the five that are fallen, before the seven last kings begin. Uh, before that, right at that point, the papacy of Rome mounts and rides the beast, the Roman Empire. And for a while, the Roman Empire allowed people to worship God on the Sabbath and Baal on Sunday. And that helped to establish and begin the two-day uh, weekend. In A.D. 247, now this is just a specific tidbit that supports what Mr. Armstrong was saying in the broadcast he gave today. Roman Emperor Dacius, Dacius, restored cults and rites and made an edict that demanded sacrifice to the state gods or execution. So his reign lasted for, you know, a few years and there was a terrible persecution under this Roman emperor from 247. I think he only lasted till about 251. And then there was a relaxation, but then from 303 to 311, Diocletian was a really bloody persecutor of any form of Christianity. Uh, he preferred divinity of the emperors, and he was one of those who was jealous of anybody worshiping any god except him as the representative of the gods of the universe, you know, the pagan gods of the universe. Later, Constantine he adopted a policy of toleration for paganism and other religions. So, wow, Christianity in all forms was able to exist under Constantine, uh, at least in the beginning days of Constantine, who actively promoted a Baal worship style of Christianity. He himself had been a sun worshiper, but not in the Christian realm. He had been a true pagan sun worshiper and believed that as he fought his battles that the sun guided him, you know, the sun of heaven guided him, and uh, he was a sun worshiper. And so when he began to recognize these Christians and try to settle, get, you know, have peace in his kingdom, and he, and he saw these Catholic bishops, they began to sway him into and these Catholic bishops way they were they had taken over buildings near the worship of a building the word that worship was the worship of the sun god and they took over the building that was the worship of the devil of the serpent the devil in Rome uh, oh they were happy to adopt these old pagan god worships you know in the worship of Baal so uh, they and Constantine the Bishops of Rome and the Constantine Emperor, he, they, Emperor Constantine, they got along just fine, and resulted in 321. Um, 
I believe that was the year that Constantine went over to Nicene and met with bishops there, and they created the Nicene Creed, which was the first Sunday law. Uh, but it was a real soft Sunday law because all it did was uh, say that the emperors would rest on Sunday. It'd be a day designed for worship. But the people out in the suburbs who had agriculture they needed to tend to, there'd be no problem with their tending their agriculture on Sunday because if they didn't do plant things at a certain time, well, they wouldn't get the blessings of heaven, blah, blah, blah. And so it was real soft Sunday worship that began, and it was later added to the Nicene Doctrine, was added, creed was added to uh, some 50 years later, after Constantine's out of office. And then the, the Council of Laodicea, they met after Constantine, they met in circa sometime around 360 A.D. Let me come back out, because that's I don't have all that on the chart. Uh, when under the emperor at that time, it was made, uh, Sunday worship was made a real heavy law and didn't just make Sunday a day of worship, it made the Sabbath a day of work, calling you a Judaizer if you worked on Sunday and worshiped on the Sabbath. If you worshiped on the Sabbath, you were a Judaizer and you were pronounced as anathema by the Roman, the Catholic Church. And once the Roman Catholic Church announced a person as anathema, the then Roman empires picked up the cue and would uh, martyr them. So here you had this two-sword policy, one of the spirit that would announce somebody as anathema, saying ah, they're going against God's word by keeping the Sabbath and not working on the Sabbath, and not resting and worshiping with us on Sunday. Now, some people got around the state God uh, thing by keeping both days. They'd keep the Sabbath, and then they'd go in and worship, you know, on Sunday so they could keep the state law thing, but they still kept their Sabbath, and they felt like they were okay with that. But then things, Satan tightened up things through his people. He said, nah, you got to work on Sabbath or else you're a Judaizer, and you got to worship on Sunday. And you can't worship on Sabbath. you got to work on Sabbath. Or be announced anathema and martyred. So uh, he tightened the guillotine on them there. Well, a lot, they burned a lot of them at the stake. But uh, the Pope has wanted Jerusalem going way back, just before they created the, the Muslim religion, the Islamic religion, before they created the Islamic religion, wrote the Quran, and pronounced people that weren't of their religion, that pronounced people that weren't of their religion as infidels. But they made a pact with the Catholic Church. Oh, okay, we won't make your Catholic monks and people infidels. You know, we'll we'll kind of have this little secret agreement between us. We'll spare them. Uh, but then, you know, they didn't keep all of their part of their deal. They didn't give Jerusalem over to the Pope. He's wanted it since way back then. Those, the, the you know, uh, Muhammad, he lived, he was born in 570 A.D., and he was doing his big campaign when he was about 60 years old in about 530 to 536 A.D. He died in 536. But he had that big slaughter campaign, 530 to 536, roughly somewhere in there, they're killing uh, Sabbath keepers and Jews by the scores, uh, both in Jerusalem and in northern Africa, and it was a grand slaughter. And then a later, years later, because uh, uh, the Catholic Church hadn't kept some, had did the Crusades against them, the Arabs wind up conquering. Uh, Constantinople. All right, I, I, I got little bits and pieces of that history. I'm still working on it, friends, but the Pope has wanted Jerusalem going way back, and it was prophesied by God back in Daniel 11, verses 40 through 45, that eventually, in the end time, the Pope will get his desire. 
for putting his palace, his office, his throne in uh, a temple in some building that they'll make a palace for the Pope in Jerusalem. So a Pope will eventually have some control over Jerusalem. And then the Pope in the Roman Empire revived the, the seventh with a seventh head, some beast that will be the head of the Roman Empire will come, bring the Roman armies in and surround some new t temple. Now, the big deal temple for the end time, as we've been going over in the past few weeks, you might want to go back and review those, those of you didn't see them and the talks by Mr. Armstrong on the fact that the temple that Jesus Christ is returning to is not going to be some physical building over in Jerusalem, but will be a spiritual temple that God has been building for the past many years and decades and has delayed his return as he continues to temper together that building, that spiritual temple that he's fitly framing to be the bride for Jesus Christ, which, wow, brethren, to me, I, as I began to learn that while I'm out at Ambassador College, I, I, as it Mr. Armstrong began for the first time to teach that, and many people were talking about, blah, 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 and asking questions like, hey, well, what about the rest of uh, people that are born into the kingdom later? Will they become the bride of Christ? And as we studied it, the answer became clear, no. That is reserved for the elect, for the first fruit, for the spring harvest. They are fitly framed and shaped and conditioned and go through things other people don't have to go through to be able to be worthy as a bride, fitly framed, fitly shaped, done by God, to be a bride for Jesus Christ. That's a most special calling. Yes, we have to overcome Satan. That's a very special big deal. <laughs> Take some effort and fight sometimes, just like someone going into a gymnasium to build weights. He can't just walk into the weight room and sit down and listen to people talk about, you know, uh, things about how wonderful weightlifting is and then not do it. You know, he's got to do what he hears. He's got to get in there and pick up those weights and uh, lift them and work them and eat protein and, you know, do things that build muscle and uh, you know, build muscle, good muscle there. You know, come over to my farm. I'll put you to some work here. You know, you can build some real, you can build physical muscle right here. I got some work that'll help you do that. But we're talking about spiritual, comparing that now to spiritual muscle. You got to do the work to have physical muscle. You've got to do the work to have spiritual character. And you've got to resist Satan, who will try to get you to cave in on this and on on that. You know, to color your stories, to lie against your neighbor, to hate your neighbor, to be jealous of your brethren because God put them here, put them there. You know, and God puts us where he wants us, friends, and it's his doing. We can, like Job, even try to run away from it. I guarantee you, I happen to know that from personal experience. God will turn you around. He'll stand you on your head, put you a few, th either put you a through a few things or let you put yourself through some things as you're resisting him that you'll later do some suffering for, but you get relief as God gives you these little joys via his spirit, which keeps your head turned straight, that helps you say, you know what, I should uh, toe this line and not go one step over to the left or one step over to the right. I should walk this straight and narrow with God's help and with his spirit, praying to him morning, noon, and night. That part of the model prayer that God encouraged us to pray uh, after we've uh, prayed, hallowed his name, ask his kingdom to come, his will on this earth be done as it is in heaven. We ask for our daily bread, which includes, we should be asking him for his Holy Spirit as more important to us than any physical bread. We should be asking for forgiveness and that and be forgiving of others because God conditions our forgiveness 
as we forgive others. So we should be asking for that and asking God, help us forgive this person or that person that has perhaps trampled all over us. <laughs> Just forgive them and forget it. Go on. And then we should not leave, get tired and exhausted in our prayer after we probably snuck in a bunch of requests for, God, would you give me this? God, would you give me that? <laughs> you know, be sure we get to the part of the prayer where we ask God, to lead us, not just yourself, me, you know, or me, not just your, your own self selfishly. God instructs us in that part of the prayer to ask for help for everybody, for all of our fellow brethren. Lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us, deliver us from the evil one who is out there like a roaring lion seeking to see us off all by ourselves or in some wrong attitude where he can pounce on us, you know, or where he can just slip, up off, slip us off into this sin or that sin and get us swallowed up where we won't be accounted worthy to escape. Then we're facing the tribulation and maybe won't have the character or the guts to stand up against the beast and say, no. I will not work on the Sabbath, and I'm going to worship on the Sabbath, and no, I'm not going to bow down and worship the image of the beast, which is that Roman Catholic Church, and its pagan gods and emperors. I'm not going to bow down and worship any of those pagan gods that, that have become an integral part of the Roman Catholic Church. Friends, that's all I have for you for today. And um, I do ask God to inspire me when I open my mouth and speak to you here on these live things. And I appreciate it when you remember to pray for me and ask God the same thing, that when I come on here live, God will speak through me. I'll also appreciate, brethren, your prayers that uh, God guide, because I do this thing little that's growing a little bit by little bit, and I've been surprised to find out. I used to just think, well, I'm just here for a few people that get stuck home once in a while. I'm surprised to find out that there are some who believe more like I do that we shouldn't join any group that calls itself the blankety blank this or blankety blank that church of God. Remember, if some of you are in such a group and you're fellowshipping and having good fellowshipping, I'm not against good fellowshipping at all, but don't consider yourself a member of this group or that group. That does something up here that shouldn't be done. Even Mr. Armstrong told us when he played a small trick on us, he asked everybody in the audience, Bible study one night, to raise your hands if you're a member of the Worldwide Church of God. This was back when Mr. Armstrong was alive in the late 70s, early 80s. I was ushering then and uh, I was in a position I think I, I think we were counting the people or something. I was in a position where I was able to turn around and see the whole audience, um, and just watch for who all raised their hands. You know, and as usher, uh, sure you don't you know you you don't have to raise your hands. So nobody knew whether I was going to raise my hand or not, but I wouldn't have because I knew Mr. I could tell by tone of voice and his playfulness everything. You know, Mr. Armstrong had some humor about him. He had some jovialness. He had some some determined seriousness for sure. But there was a lighthearted, smiling, playful side of him, too, in a, in a careful way, in a loving way for the brethren, who he recognized that God had brought in and brought and built and was building. He, he never said that. was He was just an instrument God used, he would say. But he did a little test. He asked, how many of you are members of the Worldwide Church of God. This was a time well before major apostasy, well before a lot of other groups, 600, 800, 1,000, whatever the number is, had been incorporated or associated or however they're doing it. This is back when Mr. Armstrong, when the church was back on track, more or less, and back on, after the back on track days and Mr. Armstrong asked, how many of you are members of the Worldwide Church of God? Well, a large number of hands went up. I'd say somewhere around half, maybe a little more than half, maybe less than half. I can't remember for sure, but a lot of hands went up. 
<laughs> enough that Mr. Armstrong was able to smile and tell everybody to put your hands down. He says, none of you who raised your hands and none of the rest of you in here, and he looked around to see if he had any members of the board of directors down on the front row. He said, none of you in here, I can see, are members of the Worldwide Church of God. None of you. Well, of course, some of those people that raised their hands, and maybe a few others, too, are wondering, what, in the, what is Mr. Armstrong saying? None of us are members of the Worldwide Church of God? Now, if you attended a congregation here or a congregation there that was um, part of the program, part of the Sabbath services provided under the nomenclature, the name of the Worldwide Church of God, most people would think, yeah, I, I, I'm a member. If somebody out in the world asks you, are you a member of the Worldwide Church of God? Well, well, yes, I am. I attend this congregation over here in Hooleyville, Podunkville, uh, you know, or, or wherever. Uh, yeah, so I'm a member. I attend that every week, and I was baptized by one of the member ministers of the Worldwide Church of God. Well, from what Mr. Armstrong was saying, not even the ministers who baptized you, not even any of the ministers, well, the, with a few exceptions. But let's just say it this way for the moment, and I'll ex explain the exception in just a moment. None of the ministers were members of the Worldwide Church of God unless those ministers of higher rank were on the board of directors, because as Mr. Armstrong explained it, the bylaws set forth that this was a non, the Worldwide Church of God was a non-member corporation, except for 12 board of directors. Those 12 board of directors who could be changed by the president were members of the Worldwide Church of God. And he said, and that's it, brethren, nobody else is a member. And he explained in part why he did that corporately. He did that so that the membership wouldn't be able to, you know, create popularities and, and votings and by membership action uh, uh, work against what God was doing through Mr. Armstrong as his leader from the top down. Made, it all makes good sense. But under that principle and understanding I have to ask this question. Why are there brethren out there now saying they're a member of, I'm not going to use any specific names, so let me see if I can make up some, of the Apple Church of God or the Banana Church of God or the Carrot Church of God or the Tutti Fruity Church of God? Mr. Armstrong told us we were not members of the worldwide Church of God and gave us the principle and understanding of why, and he explained. We are are members of the body of Christ, which he said is a spiritual organism. And yes, he said, that makes us a member of the Church of God, a non-corporate entity, a spiritual organism, not a physical organization of any kind. And yet, he then he gave a full balance on this. He did also explain that, yes, when there's a spiritual body, a spiritual organism in one, we can then uh, physically organize and to be in consort with, uh, maybe there's a better word than consort, to be in conformity uh, with the laws of man, you know, to, to be, to work legally and where we appropriately can, as long as there's no violation of God's law in doing so. We can honor man's ways and pay taxes where we have to pay taxes on employees and FICA and, you know, and where we own property. We can own it in the name of a corporation, the assets of the body of Christ, so they can be protected physically, you know, in, in ways that are wise. You know, be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, um, you know, and use, use money for good purposes and all that. So, but the question goes back now with, with all of those things on the table and being understood. The question goes back, why are there some people today 
claiming to be members of this banana peeling church of God or that banana peeling church of God. And by banana peeling, I'm, not, I'm only using the expression that relates to an adjective. Uh, there's an expression that says the banana peeling is the adjective. No, it says it the other way. I'm sorry. It says the adjective is the banana peeling of the parts of speech. And when you put this word or that word in front of or behind church of God, that makes that, that's an adjective. And when you put it in the form of church of God as to be a church group that people can join and become members of, which most church groups do it that way, they want you to think of that as uh, the church God is using today, the church of God, this banana peeling church of God over here or that banana peeling church of God over there, the apple church of God, the carrot church of God, the orange church of God, you know, the there's a whole bunch of those, and one fellow that finished the entire Bible correspondence course who contacted me and said, hey, I've been watching your uh, Sabbath te television program ever since I saw Robert Collins in the hospital with cancer. Give it from his bed. I said, wow. I said, well, well have you, are you attending services on the Sabbath anywhere? Have you ever attended? He said, no, never have. He said, uh, I've gone all the way through the 58 lessons of the Ambassador College Correspondence Course, and he says, about time I would have started looking for a church, you guys split up. And he said, that's the most confusing thing I've ever seen. you got this church of God and that church of God and one and another. And he said, that's confusion. And he was upset about that, kind of chewed me out as if maybe I was, he thought I was partly responsible for that. I him, hey, you know, if you're listening now and watching, you know, look, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't do that. I don't have a Church of God group you can join. Now, I'm praying hard about, you know, what am I going to do this year? past few years, I've taken some handicapped people down to Florida. We've held a small uh, Feast of Tabernacle services every day, and just a few of us, and I'd put it live on the air for people either uh, at home handicapped or elderly or who for some reason wouldn't be going to the feast or didn't want to go with any uh, particular group here or there. We'd provide service on the Internet. Now, friends, when I was first asked before Mr. Collins died to continue the work he was doing with the Nightcast program and the weekend Sabbath service live stream, I thought, well, hey, the biggest thing we'll be doing is the Nightcast news program, you know. And, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll keep it all going, and I'll just keep a little service thing going for maybe a rotating group of people who will just be stuck somewhere on the Sabbath. But... I've come to find out, it's not a huge number, but I've come to find out there are more people uh, uh, watching the Life Sabbath stream than there, there are watching my Nightcast program, which is on five nights a week. And uh, Now, maybe if we were able to analyze this more carefully, maybe the certain numbers that watch during the week, uh, maybe some of those rotate in and out so that there's some people watching Sunday that didn't watch Monday that are watching Tuesday that causes the number to be higher than I realize it is. But until we're able to do that, it appears that there's more people uh, who tune in here on the Sabbath, which is going to make me more careful with it, especially as I get attacks from Muslim people who are able to tune in, both to this and the Nightcast. Uh, by careful, though, it doesn't mean I'm going to avoid the truth, but it does mean, uh, but uh, I'm going to stay with the truth fully. I'll be careful maybe in how I say it, uh, you know, especially as I go into things like, you know, stepping on some of your toes who believe you're a member of this group or that group, um, where Mr. Armstrong told us we weren't even a member of the worldwide Church of God. So I just have to ask you the question again. Why are you saying you're a member of this group or that group today? You know, and why do we have so many groups? You know, it's because we have so many ministers who... Each say, I'm going to do my own thing. You know, and I, I don't see God over uh, th working through any one person. So I'm over here and I'm over here. You know, and that's got me over here because there's not one <clears throat> riding over us right now. And I'm, But I'm not starting a group. Uh, the minister I worked under was had learned as he got cancer in the hospital, don't nominate, don't denominate, don't put a name with Church of God for any group people can think they can join. So uh, 
So we just do a ministry, a Church of God ministry, and that's how he set it up and passed it on to me, and that's how we operate. You can't join that, you know. Uh, even ministers were not members of the Worldwide Church of God. But, um, friends, the point I was just about going to was that um, we, we have more people watching on Sabbath than are doing on Nightcast, and um, I'm going to try to get more hymns done up so we can, and, and there are some brethren that are meeting, uh, let me tell you the good part of this first, there's good news, bad news, but the bad news will be eliminated, hopefully, with something I hope to help do. I went to a funeral a few months ago up in northern part of Alabama, not the one I went to recently of Ray Epperson. Uh, I, I went to Ray's burial, not his funeral. He was had a funeral in North Carolina, but was buried here in Alabama. I went to the burial, even did a little graveside myself for Ray, and that's on on my timeline on Facebook. Uh, let's see, it's on YouTube. I don't have it. I, I should put a link on our archive page for anybody that wants to see that. Actually, I think it is because it's one of our nightcast programs, the day that Ray was buried and had his funeral. But I went to another funeral of a brethren, long-time brethren, up in northern Alabama, northeast Alabama, where I met some brethren who, uh, uh, as I talked to them, I said, well, uh, what are you guys doing for the Sabbath? Well, our minister uh, moved us over to Sunday. They stayed under Jody Koch Jr.'s administration. And as that minister went over to Sunday, they just went with him. So I asked him a few questions. I had to ask another man who had started working on the Sabbath from time to time when I first got back here uh, to show me in the Bible wh wh where it says we go to Sunday from the Bible. Because, you know, the Catholic Church tells you they did it, and you won't find it in the Bible anywhere. And the Catholic Church is right about that. They did it. They switched it to Sunday, and you won't find that in the Bible. So my friend uh, nod for a moment, and well, no, he didn't. He just after uh, after a couple of times I asked him, he just came right out as if a weight had been on his back lifted. He said, "You know, I knew something was wrong. I've been feeling a monkey on my back every time I work on the Sabbath. And you know, from a little kid, I used to see the Seventh Day Adventist billboards, and I knew them people were right about the Sabbath. You know, and then God called me later, and so then I said." Uh, his name's not Joe, but I'm just going to use Joe. Even though he doesn't mind my telling you his name, I'm going to not use his name. I said, well, Joe, will I? I just asked him, well, I, I just said to him, we had been talking. I said, I'll see you next Sabbath. He said, no, I'll be working next Sabbath. So then I asked him the question I told you, well, show me from the Bible where it says we don't keep the Sabbath anymore. And then after a couple comments and things, he, first he said he first he defended it by saying, "Well, Mr. Tukach said we we got families to feed, and uh, we, you know we should work all the time. We can get work. We get work on the Sabbath. We work, feed our families." I said, "I think you got plenty of work during the week." I said, "Show me in a Bible where it says we don't observe the Sabbath, and that the Sabbath's been done away, where we don't remember it, keep it holy, and not do any servile work." That's when he said uh, that. Ever since he's a little kid, he knew we should keep the Sabbath, and there's been a monkey on my back every time I've been working on the Sabbath. I just, just felt this monkey on my back. So uh, after he said whatever he said, a few more things maybe, I, and I said, well, Joe, will I see you next Sabbath? He said, yeah, I'm telling my boss this week I'm not working next Sabbath. Even if he fires me, I'll see you next Sabbath. <laughs> so, hey, guy can use any of us. I was just layman at that time, and I just asked the question. Show me where it says Sabbath's been done away. He couldn't do it in the Bible. He couldn't do it, and it made him think, and it made him open up, and he quit the job working on the Sabbath. So I asked these people at the funeral that were telling me, well, our minister moved us over to Sunday. I said, where is it in the Bible? It says we don't observe the Sabbath anymore. Oh, boy, one of them especially, uh, an elder lady got a little fidgety and started trying to explain a little bit and said but started to sound like my other friend for a moment and she's called one of my uh, people I see a legally blind man who I help out in some ways who's south of me down in Vance she called him and said you know we'd like to meet on the Sabbath but n nobody providing a service or anything for us on Sabbath and these are elderly people that don't get on the internet. They don't have smartphones, and they don't have computers and desktops and internet and all that 
all that. There are some people, friends, as big as the Internet's gotten, there are some people that don't. So I've made an overture. I asked my friend, I said, for, get me their phone number. I want to call them. And then if you talk to them before I do, let them know. If they can find a place up there, I'll try to pay for it myself, drive up every Sabbath, and hold a service for them. Now, what I'll try to do, friends, is this, because um, I have the number of people that tune in here on the Sabbath. I will try to get a place where I can get Internet hooked up where we could do our live service from that place on the Sabbath. Now, we won't call it any blankety-blank Church of God, but although we are the Church of God. You know, brethren, the Church of God is not a building, not an organization, although it is you and me. We are the Church of God. The members of the Church of God are the Church of God. I mean, you know, and God does say when he's talking about his church, he says it's composed, comprised of many members, but it's one body. One body, not many bodies, not many little groups broken up off over here and there. It's one body, a spiritual organism composed of many members, and those many members are you and me. Um, but just to keep the live stream going and maybe having it in a little in a way that can be enjoyable, I do want to. No matter how we do it, I do want to uh, to try to get. Uh, work hymns in that we can sing together on the Sabbath and create a time that, you know, I have people around me saying, Steve, time to go, and it's time for me to go now. Two hours is the maximum. So uh, we that's something I'm looking into and ab about which, brethren, I will appreciate the prayers of those of you who tune in and watch on a regular basis. I'll appreciate your hearty prayers before God to guide me and to open or close doors as he wishes for things to be done on what I'm looking into for these people in Northeast Alabama where we could do live stream from there. And uh, I, I could set up a screen and still do some of the things we do and have Mr. Armstrong appear, which I would always want to do in a Sabbath service. I was able to talk one minister one time. I'd go visit his service and he said, oh, come on back. I say, I will, but if you'll start playing Mr. Armstrong in the service. So he said, bring a tape of Mr. Armstrong next time you come. So, hey, I did. And he kept his word, and we played Mr. Armstrong. Now, there were one woman spoke up even during the service and complained. But at least, uh, brethren, there are some out there who will do it and who don't complain, who see the value. And even though Mr. Armstrong has died, so have the gospel writers. You know, his words are still alive. They are, there are many things God told us, taught us through Mr. Armstrong that many of us either haven't heard or haven't fully comprehended or have forgotten because Mr. Armstrong, he was a hard worker. He was diligent. He was enthusiastic and full of energy, even in his last five or six years as he reached 90 years old in 91 and 92 and then as he reached 93 he started to be slowing down and have some problems and uh, began to have longer spaces between his speaking and more uhs and had a huge magnifying glass and still could hardly read the words of his bible uh, you know his very last few months were difficult for him but he persisted. <laughs> he had just finished the book uh, that he felt was a summary of all the truths and treasures God had given to us through him. Uh, he had just finished that Mystery of the Ages book roughly six months before he died in his last year. And in his Last year and the few years preceding that, he was traveling to congregation after congregation in the United States and had been had made several trips overseas, some last trips to see the King of Spain and other world leaders. One final witness in that way and one final contact with those who would be behind the scenes putting together the the concrete blocks that were the beginning's foundation for the coming 
United States of Europe, a federation of the EU, and who were putting together the foundational blocks for that euro, the one, you know, one money. There's basically three things we're looking for. A monetary union, that's come about. A political union, that is being shaped. And a military union, that will be coming as part of what's being shaped together as a union of European countries that will eventually be remapped or redistributed somehow to be to represent five toes from the east and five toes from the west. Five of miry clay, five of iron, meaning essentially they won't get along, but a crisis will come along, some event, whether it be the Ukraine, the Islamic State, Iraq, um, the, the Israel, Iran, the South China Seas, China, Japan, Vietnam, Hong Kong, uh, Thailand, those that are vying, no, Hong Kong's not vying for them, I don't think, those islands in the South China Seas, whatever the events are that bring together again the two stages, the Pacific theater and the European theater that foment us into another round, round three of World War. Uh, Mr. Armstrong had gone and made his last contacts for information related to that. And we're now, with what he has left us, we're watching that carefully, as you and I should be doing, as Christ told us in Luke 30, 21, 36. And I meant to read the rest of that verse a moment ago to you, and that we'll conclude with that, and that'll wrap up my two hours. Uh, Christ didn't just say, watch you therefore these things that precede the fifth seal, and pray being an active part of these daily activities and world events, because you can affect how they come out by your prayers to God, by asking Him things. You might move Him to do, well, okay, I'll do this or that. And if He sees us really on fire, God may say, hey, Jesus, the delay is over. I finally got this group of hard-nosed, hard-headed, thick-skulled, uh, half-asleep people. I finally got them awake, and now... Enough of them are praying and being involved with the world news and are vigilant enough and want to see you return that we can wrap this thing up. And he says, as a promise in the rest of that, if you're doing this, if you are watching with vigilance and praying with your heart about what you see in the world news, we try to make that job easy for you on Nightcast. 5.30 Pacific time off the West Coast, and then other time. That's a live time. It's available anytime on demand, as many of you know, uh, via our archive video, where, and we also stick them over on YouTube. And we try to help you be able to watch news as we're supposed to. We focus in on the things that relate to these things we're supposed to watch and pray about. And God has a promise in there, if you do it, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. And where are we? What's about to come next? What has Mr. Armstrong told us? And there's no change on this, brethren, whatsoever. Mr. Armstrong has told us the next major event in prophecy is the fifth seal. Let me bring that chart on. One, two, three, four are running now. And the fourth one has pestilence to it, has earthquakes and other seismic activity, gale force winds of all kinds, including Al Albert. we got to check and see what he's doing up the East Coast. So far, we are all safe, I believe. Uh, and Tarak, Tarak, a trouble, that trouble that leads up to the mega trouble, that leads up to the Great Tribulation. God says that, uh, and Mr. Armstrong has explained to us, the fifth seal, the Great Tribulation, is the next major event to happen in prophecy. And Christ says that if you watch the first four and pray about those first four, then you may be accounted, and you do that, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. And the things that shall come to pass are those things that begin with the next seal, the fifth seal, the great tribulation. You do, if you if you got any wisdom at all, Unless you are so strong in your faith and want to be a martyr, say, that's the way I want to do it. Okay, fine. But if you're like many of the rest of us, 
you may well prefer to escape what's coming, the time of Jacob's trouble, so bad no time before it's ever been so bad, a time after it's so bad no time ever again will be so bad, a time of tribulation, a time of martyrdom during that tribulation where we've been told that part of your martyrdom will include torture. Now, if you're bold and able and brave enough to go through that, more power to you. There will be some left behind because they were lukewarm who will. Their way out of it is the fiery trial of martyrdom. And Christ will come at that time and knock on your door and say, listen, I went through it. I was crucified. I was martyred. This is your only way out. And if you will endure this fiery trial to the end, if you will endure this martyrdom, you will indeed sup with me at my marriage table, at the marriage supper, with the rest of the brethren, some of whom will remain alive until I come and return and, be, and come up after you do. Because if you endure as a martyr, you'll be part of the dead in Christ who rise first, as, first, as God tells us in First. Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15, you will rise first to meet Christ in the air, and then they who are alive in the Lord shall come up after you. You'll have a few more seconds in eternity than the rest of us who are still alive at Christ's return. So there's a glory in being a martyr. Yeah, indeed. It, if you wind up in that condition, don't give up heart. Christ will come and knock on your door and encourage you. To endure, to endure to the end, to hang in there like he did. He cried the night before he was crucified, God, is there a way this cup can pass from me? When he realized there, there wasn't, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but Father, your will be done. And he endured the crucifixion. And brethren, he hopes that we don't have to. He says, if you'll watch and pray always, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are to come. He, he and the Father are preparing a place in the wilderness. In the, as Daniel 11 tells us, Daniel 11, Daniel 12, it tells us the areas that are protected during the great the tribulation, the place to which God will gather those who are accounted worthy and take us, is where the children of Ammon are and where, um, right below that, uh, where those three areas. I was just looking at this verse yesterday. And um, here, i got Daniel 12 open. And I think I can find it real quickly where he mentions. If you, some of you may want to see it. It's in verse 41 of Daniel 11, uh, where it says, But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. There is the triangulation or the three-state area, the tri-state area, uh, tri-country area, where that'll be protected at the time, in the end time, when uh, the king of the north will invade Jerusalem and, and the king of the north and the king of the south are fighting and uh, Armageddon is breaking loose. There's that little area. Ammon, Edom, and Moab. I got that backward. Ammon, 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 Moab, and Edom that is protected. I think that's the right order. During the Great Tribulation, that's very likely from what Daniel 11 says, the place that God talks about in Revelation 17, uh, Revelation 12, where God tells us that the woman will be protected and taken to uh, a place prepared in the wilderness. Uh, Revelation 12, verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, which she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her, nourish her, protect her, train her for final, for marriage to Christ, and final training. A thousand two hundred and three score days, that's 1260 days, that's three and a half years. Friends, we're, I'm out of time. Got to go. Thanks for joining me on this Sabbath. 
I'll be here uh, live again next for Nightcast, Sunday night. Hope you'll join us for the Nightcast program and be praying about both things. Be praying about the brethren in northeastern Alabama and a place where I could hold a service for them where they could conveniently come out, meet together on the Sabbath, people that have been meeting on Sunday because their minister took them over to Sunday and they got no other minister out there and they got no internet and... Um, they would like to be meeting on the Sabbath. For their sake, I'll really appreciate your prayers for what God would want us to do and help us to do it. Open the doors where we should go through and close where we shouldn't. I'll appreciate that very much. Thanks for joining me today. I wish you a really good rest of the Sabbath and a wonderful and great week. Until I see you again here, Stephen Lloyd Gilbert. Again, thanks for joining me. Happy Sabbath. Happy week.